You're listening to Wasteoids. From cult horror and sci-fi to B-movie splatterfests, to underground music documentaries, concert films, public access shows, indie label showcases, and original programs, Night Flight Plus is the coolest place online for weird and riveting viewing. Right now, Wasteoids listeners can get $10 off an annual membership. That means access to Night Flight's library for only $29.99 a year. Head to www.nightflightplus.com backslash promo code and enter Wasteoids in all caps. That's W-A-S-T-O-I-D-S. Enter promo code Wasteoids at nightflightplus.com backslash promo code and get back in the days. Hey, I'm Jason Woodbury, and this is another installment of Wasteoids with Trevor Shelley DeBrow, guitarist of Chicago art metal band Pelican, Chord, and Relayer. Relayer just released a new self-titled album on Gilead Media, and it blends thrash elements with shoegaze textures, drones, and a sense of triumphant melodicism. When he isn't playing music, he serves as the emo ambassador to Chicago's Numero Group record label and works with the publicity firm Biz3. He joined us to discuss it all. The new Relayer album, the music of prog rockers Yes, from which they take their name, the origins of post-rock, and Pelican's new partnership with Thrill Jockey Records, which will reissue the band's first three albums, 2005's The Fire in Our Throats Will Beckon the Thaw, 2003's Australasia, and 2007's City of Echoes over the course of 2020 and 2023. How's it going, man? You know, it's going. Uh, it's uh, it's pandemic good, right? Sure. I mean, I heard it was over, though. The pandemic? Yeah, it's over. By some accounts, yeah. I mean... And then also not over. Hold on, I'm turning on the uh, Do Not Disturb on my phone because I'm getting like a plethora of texts while we're talking here. It's so funny. That's something I was going to ask you about was how you balance um, working for a huge PR firm as well as playing music, as well as being a dad. I mean, it's a lot, right? Yeah, but also I'd like... Uh, one thing I was going to say before we got started was like, I would prefer not to talk about work. <laughs> sure. Totally, totally, totally. Let's just keep it just creatively. How do you balance? You've got multiple projects too. That's true. Um, I think for me, I, is this it? Have we started the interview already? We just started it. Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Jumping right in. Um, for me, the, uh, the creation of music is a compulsion. And sure. so it's sort of like this thing that while I have obviously like a day job and a family, uh, every other available corner of my life, I try to fill with uh, creative endeavors, just not because of, of any like specific game plan or anything like that. It's just sort of like, I have a compulsion to do that stuff. So it's really just like filling every corner with that, that I can find. Yeah, that's really, I mean, I, I, I relate and I empathize for sure. It's, it's a thing that is like, a. yeah, it can, it, it, it can be tough to figure out said balance as I mentioned, but you got to do it. You got to make the stuff, right? You've been playing. I imagine you've been playing since you were a teenager playing music. Yeah, I, uh, I figure when did I start doing bands? I guess freshman year of high school is when I started like pursuing music. Well, I I was gonna say seriously, but I guess it wasn't like a serious endeavor at that point. But you know, <laughs> yeah, it was I like mean... that was when the drive to play guitar and like do stuff really uh, took hold because I I'd like played in like school band in like junior high school and played like clarinet and trombone and stuff like that but like it was really once i had a guitar in my hand and i was able to create something of my own that was when it really like caught fire waste toys listeners will have heard me discuss playing clarinet in high school as well so <laughs> I, I salute you i salute you as a fellow clarinetist uh do, do you remember what what records made you want to 
play guitar if if you had to pinpoint them? Um, I think I was just like enamored from a, an early age of just the way guitar looked, like the way it looked when people would play guitar. Um, yeah, the actual accessibility of it as an instrument, like uh, I think, really coincided with discovering punk. So like sure, sure. At freshman year of high school, I made a friend, Josh Grubman, who made me a mixtape that had like I'm trying to think of all the bands that were on it. It was like Naked Raygun, Screeching Weasel, uh, Ramones and all that stuff just like made guitar, which had previously seemed like this esoteric instrument that only like these maestros and like uh, sure. rosos could play and suddenly it, it to open the door to this like accessibility of it. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I don't really need to learn how to do anything. I could just like start playing it. Yeah, that, that's such a liberating and exciting feeling, especially as a teenager, you know, like that the walls come down in a big way. It's really cool. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, there were people in my high school that like were like studied like uh, musicians that like actually knew how to play and stuff like that. And it was kind of like, well, yeah, you can do that or you can do this. <laughs> like they're both equally valid art forms, uh, though, so, though they weren't so easily convinced. <laughs> well, yeah, sure, sure. So did you, uh, when you started learning guitar, did you pretty much sort of abandon the music theory side of things that you probably would have been having to engage with to play in high school band? Or did you kind of venture into that with guitar? No, I, I definitely abandoned it. Um, and have, it, you, have you come back to it since? Uh, uh, I would say that I am more aware of it uh, now than I was at that time. But sure. like, I, I I play guitar by ear. I don't like. I kind of know some scales, but it's not really like music theory isn't really the basis of anything that I do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I want to jump over to your project Relayer, and it's kind of a cardinal sin when interviewing somebody about their music to ask about the band name, but I have to risk it in this case <laughs> because I read that it was inspired by a Yes, the Yes song uh, or album. album I yeah. can't remember which. Is that is that true? Yeah, that's that's very much true. Where do you, where do you stand on on yes? Because the reason I was willing to risk it is I like yes an awful lot, a certain certain periods, you know. But I'm I'm curious where you stand on yes. <laughs> I fucking love yes. But um, to to clarify, I'm really from yes album up to relayer, and like the stuff on either end of that, like I'm not as sure. versed in, or I could take or leave probably. But th those those that stretch going for the one too actually. Um, yeah, let's leave it Wait, at that. Going, what 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 it's like what's like the the sound of going for the one? You don't do you do you follow them into the sort of new new wave era they, at all? That's like just preceded the new wave era. So that's like okay. It's after Relayer. So Relayer is the last of the run of really esoteric like mind-bending prog stuff and going sure, for the sure. one I think uh it's like maybe six songs instead of three and like there are shorter lengths and like it's a little bit more accessible and it's definitely the their their pathway toward like radio rock and accessibility in the 80s it's really funny when you think about all of the prog bands of the 70s who totally segued into the 80s as hit machines <laughs> yeah. like it's kind of nuts because like I mean Genesis, uh, uh, so so many. Yes, obviously. Mm -hmm. I want to say you know, I mean Asia. I was all... gonna say Asia is one of the first bands that I super loved growing up. Re really? So when you, so you you alluded a little bit to like how you played guitar as a kid and and you had or you how you had the perception as a kid that it was like a, a an instrument for virtuosos. Is that because you were kind of a prog head? No, not so much. I mean, like the. Asia is a band that I picked up because of my older brother. Um, sure. Actually, a lot of the stuff that I listened to was stuff that I, I listened to because my older brothers were listening to it, like Iron Maiden. Uh, and like U2 was like the first big band that like became kind of my own thing where like they would play it, but like I became obsessed with it. Um, and like all that stuff, like 
even to this day, like I listen to U2 records and I'm not like crazy about U2 anymore the way I was back then. But like when I listen to them, I'm like, I don't really know what the fuck the edge is doing. You know what I mean? It's like so yeah. laden <laughs> and delay and like other effects. And like, he's got this really like intricate idiosyncratic playing style. And it's like trying to unpack and decode that is just like, it's, uh, it's a fool's errand. So yeah, I mean, to yeah, a certain right. extent, it's like I would listen to stuff like that, and I would not have the faintest idea of how to recreate it. Sure, sure. So then, by the time, yeah, when you hear like a screeching weasel record, you're like, I get it. It's the two fingers. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty pretty easy to recreate. But yeah, yeah, and, and um, to, on this side of uh of history like now i know too that like not only is it like really simple music like even like ben weasel didn't know that you could uh, at first didn't know that you could play the power chord on more than one string so he would be jumping up and down the entire length of the neck playing those songs <laughs> it's like yeah i mean it's definitely made for people that don't know what they're doing <laughs> yeah whereas yes is you might say slightly more technically <laughs> proficient perhaps yeah <laughs> yeah i uh i feel like prog is you know we live in an age where like every music genre is sort of up for grabs right like uh you can you can be into new age and i am and you can be into you know whatever uh amorphous electronic stuff you can do kind of whatever i don't know if i'm completely making this up but i feel like there is still prog is still like a bridge too far for a quite a lot of people i encounter you know what i mean to an extent but i feel like Prague has made real leaps and bounds in uh in people's ex in uh i feel like it's not nearly as uh derided as it as it once was sure and i feel like i see a lot more people referencing like yes and king crimson than when when i was coming up in high school and like college like no one would dare mention those, those acts, you know? And now I feel like there's a little bit more openness to it. I remember I went to a record store when I was like uh, 21 or something, and I, I bought a Yes record, mm -hmm. Fragile. fragile, And uh, maybe I was 20. I don't know what it was, but I was, I was young-ish, and my friends were all goofing on me. <laughs> and then the clerk at the counter... I was sure he would goof on me, but he was like a total prog nerd. So he was like, "Those don't don't listen to those guys. They don't have any idea what they're talking about." And I was like, "Yeah, you hear that? Yeah, and I, yes, it's cool." And you know what? When you bought it, it was probably two ninety nine, and now you have to pay like nine ninety nine for that record. Can you imagine? Yeah, coming across <laughs> like that's back when you would buy records. I would buy records, you know, because I could get more of them than CDs. You know what I oh, mean? Yeah, like I could go totally. into the store with the same amount of money, get a lot more records than I could CDs, which were whatever twenty two dollars or whatever insane price. You know, that's how I got started on record collecting too. And I can see that you and I went in uh, about the same direction with it. <laughs> Yeah, I spent a couple decades mostly <laughs> just buying records, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's, I mean, I, the the new Relayer record is, is so cool. And, and I hear, like, obviously, you know, all, all of your work, like Solo, the Pelican stuff, Relayer, you can hear different sort of influences, different threads that go through it. But, you know, you can definitely hear some thrashy moments on this new Relayer record. There's always cool atmospheric stuff. Um but I really, I really enjoyed listening to it. It's really, it's a lot of fun. Thank you. Um, how, 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 how long have you? I mean, you guys have been making records since I think maybe what 2016 or something. Yeah, but how time. long have, how long have you known uh, Colin and uh, and Stephen? I've known Colin since he was in Dakota, Dakota, which was his band with Mike Sullivan prior to Russian Circles. So mm -hmm. over 20 years, I guess, at this point. Even yeah. like I was aware of his work, but um, Relayer originally came together uh, as almost like a fluke. Uh, he he and I both know this gentleman, Keith Utek, who runs Utek Records in Milwaukee, and he does a fest every so often. And, and one of the uh, installments of Utek Fest in 2014, he was just sort of putting duos together to see what would happen. And he suggested that Steven and I play together and just put something together for the fest. 
Uh, and we were both open to it and like both kind of knew each other's work, but didn't know each other had never met. And we just met up and jammed a few times and played the festival. And then we kind of just kept pursuing it. Uh, and that was sort of the, the, the creation of the relay or creative partnership. And if I understand right, the, you basically had the, the, the songs for this one recorded, pre-pandemic right is that is that correct yeah we pretty much finished writing the record um and we like when <laughs> i guess it was like the last show we played was february 2020 and we were looking at recording the album that summer because we were pretty much done writing yeah uh, and then <laughs> we just you know the pandemic hit and then like we stopped practicing for a while Colin lives in Michigan, so even when Stephen and I started practicing again, it was kind of like getting Colin down here was really tr- challenging. Sure, so we just kept playing the same songs over and over again, and like tightening them up. And then the ones that uh, are have a little bit more of an open structure, they just kind of stretched out and got broader and like took on a life of their own. So, yeah, that it was uh, it was kind of cool to like frustrating and cool to have this extra time to work on this stuff. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Without a healthy mind, being truly happy and at peace is hard. The good news is therapy works. But what is therapy exactly? Well, it's whatever you need it to be. Maybe you're not feeling motivated right now and would like some tools to help. Maybe you're feeling insecure in relationships or at work or not dealing well with stress. Whatever you need, it's time to stop being ashamed of normal human struggles and start feeling better because you deserve to be happy. And now you don't have to worry about finding an in-person therapist near you to help. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Join the millions of people who are seeing what online therapy is really about. It's always a good time to invest in yourself because you are your greatest asset. As a special offer to Waste Toys listeners, you can get 10% off your first month of professional therapy at betterhelp.com slash wastoids. That's betterhelp.com slash wastoids. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode. It has has was the pandemic the longest stretch you had ever been just kind of in one place uh, for for that long in a while? Or do you tend to not travel out too much unless, you know, Pelican's on tour or something like that? No, definitely. Like I uh, it's definitely by far the longest I've gone without playing a show because uh, I only just started playing again last month in May. Uh, so yeah, it was well over two years without shows and uh yeah i mean like i'm i'm very used to traveling not just with the bands but like in normal life for work all that stuff so it was it felt very different it, very weird and like not very inspiring to be honest it was hard to like like we the, one of the reasons we kept working on the same songs is because there was no inspiration for new stuff sure sure yeah it's a tough time right like it's worked i know different ways for different people Mm -hmm. getting having the privilege to talk to so many different creators and stuff in you know uh through the wasteoid stuff and through aquarium drunkard it's like i know some people were able to keep making stuff other people a lot of people i've talked to have just been like no i didn't feel like making anything like i didn't want to do that you know like that didn't feel and it wasn't that they didn't want to. It's just there wasn't ideas or there weren't, you know. Uh, so it's so it's interesting. How did it feel feel getting back to playing shows? I mean, was it pretty pretty thrilling? Yeah, I mean, it feels incredible. Uh, yeah, I haven't really been able to figure out how to even put it into words because it's just like to be cut off from something that's so central to my identity for so long and then to come back to it. It's like I feel like a different person now. Yeah, I yeah. really do. I feel like, like this weight has been lifted from me or something. That's that's fascinating. So, could you tell me a little bit about what what Pelican is up to right now? Because I mean, you've started. When did when did you all resume? Sort of like, uh, you know, work on the band in relation to the pandemic. Uh, Pelican was also in kind of like a situation where we weren't really doing anything just because uh that is also a long distance band larry lives in la and the rest of us live here in chicago actually at the beginning of the pandemic brian lived in la too 
uh, but he moved back about a year ago. And, um, you know, we weren't making any progress working on new stuff. There was some talk about file sharing and like we did a couple things that we tried to work on through that method, but it just wasn't going anywhere. For me, my creativity is activated by being in a room with a drummer more than anything and definitely in a room with other musicians. Sure. So it was, uh, it was disheartening that we couldn't get anywhere with the band and that it felt kind of like a huge pause button was hit. Um, but then at some point during the pandemic, uh, our former label, uh, Hydrahead, who put out our first three albums announced that they were going to go, uh, they, they were, um, that they were stopping operations and all the bands were welcome to take their records and do whatever they wanted with them. Uh, and we ended up licensing them to thrill jockey. And from that point forward, we started really digging in on doing this reissue campaign for our first three albums. Uh, replete with like remastering the audio for all of the stuff, digging up rarities that nobody had heard before. And it kind of like gave us a creative drive that was like more uh, focused on our past instead of like focusing on the future. And that kind of reinvigorated us and kind of gave us a, a sense of purpose again, which was really great. Um, uh, and then late last year, our guitar player Dallas, who had been in the band since 2012, uh, decided that he wanted to step away from the band. And uh, and we already had shows booked for this year. So we ended up, because we had been focusing on this early material, we asked our guitar player, our founding guitar player, Laurent, uh, if he would be willing to uh, join up with us and play some shows, uh, which made sense because we had been in close contact all this time over the yeah. pandemic working on these reissues. And fortunately he said yes. And like, we now we've got two shows under our belt and it just feels so incredible to re-engage with that period of the band and like to do it with the original lineup. And it's felt really incredible. When you went back and listened to those, the first, what year was the first record? Uh, the demo was, I want to say 2001. And then the first album was 2003. Okay, so we're coming up on you know twenty years, twenty plus years in some of the case. When you bet went back and listened to that stuff, uh, those records, what did you hear in yourself? Like, did you did it feel? You mentioned feeling like a different person on the other side of the pandemic. Did you feel like you were listening to a different person at all in regards to those records? Yeah, I did. I felt like there's a sense of. Um, there was a sense of disconnection where I couldn't understand where like the perspective of the player on the, the record that wrote those parts. But there was also an admiration because I had for so long thought of myself as like this naive undeveloped player. Uh, and when I kind of looked back on those records as with almost like a slight sense of shame for how undeveloped of a player I was or something. Sure. And listening back, I was like, uh, there are some really creative, <laughs> inspired ideas that I didn't give myself credit for at the time. And uh, I'm really impressed <laughs> that we wrote that stuff. Yeah. I really awesome. Because it's like, uh, especially like the place that Pelican plays in my own trajectory, it, like it still feels like it was real, really early and like we hadn't figured out what we wanted to do and what we were doing. And like, to hear such complex ideas coming from that mindset is like pretty interesting. Yeah. I mean, they always talk about like beginner's mind or whatever, right. That you can, mm -hmm. you really do sometimes create when you have less of a sense of what to do. Sometimes you have more of a sense of what's possible. It's a really weird, a really weird thing. But what was it that, that, I mean, Pelican obviously are, you know, a kind of, stalwart uh figure in in your guys's genre right i mean you guys really helped to sort of establish a template that's reverberated in the years since and mutated into different other forms you know lots of different stuff but when you look listened back to the stuff um you know what what was your sort of when you first started pelican did you have a sense of what you wanted to make or or, or what was the what was the sort of uh mindset that you had in the early days of the band 
I think when we very, very first started, it was kind of like we were listening to a lot of like stoner rock. And uh, so we were listening to a lot of like Goat Snake, God Flesh, and Earth. And we wanted to find some way to throw all that stuff in a cauldron and kind of like play, pay homage to it. Yeah. Um, and then it was kind of like, by the, and I think the demo that's, that's really apparent the uh, it now goes by the title untitled ep um but by the time we reached the first album i think we had started incorporating all these other sort of ideas and influences i know like we were really into slow dive uh i was really into red house painters and like sort of like all these melodic undercurrents started like pouring into the music that hadn't been there previously i remember recording australasia uh, and listening to mixes of it and being really excited that we were kind of like on this, uh, what felt like uh, unexplored territory. And then I got an advance of Isis's Oceanic album. <laughs> and that record also has a bunch of melodic moments on it. I was like, holy shit, like, like all these different people from different places that have kind of like a similar mindset are starting to explore this new avenue of sound. Uh, it felt like a really exciting time. That's fascinating. Do you, f I mean, I think about that all the time. Like I think about the, uh, I think about like the sort of, um, differing currents of like post pandemic records. Cause that thing you said sort of like, I'm jumping train of thought a little bit here, but you mentioned, you know, hearing that ISIS record and sort of realizing like your, like your band was part of a thing that was happening right emerging across different groups and obviously you know all across the country and really all across the world but um i think about like the like the like post pandemic records have kind of either have been like very somber or very celebratory you know what i mean and it's kind of funny when you think like so many people are thinking to themselves like oh wow i'm i'm on the cusp of something with this thing that's so different and then sort of realizing like a lot of people are reading the same telepathic currents i don't know if that makes any sense but it totally does because i mean even if you look at the foundation of the punk scene it was something that evolved all over the world at the same time in different countries uh of people that were not aware of each other and yeah. they're all just like consuming the same records like it was like the stooges raw power made it to all these different places and like changed everybody's lives at the same time and that's yeah. just how it manifested yeah yeah well that's so that's so cool and i mean looking back on 20 years of a, of a project that must feel like a very uh sort of surreal thing yeah uh yeah, for sure. Because like I, I don't. I feel like it's still just sinking in, like where those records exist in the in the in the in the course of history, and yeah. whether anybody else even sees it that way, I don't, I don't know. But I'm really excited to have a new label partner and to be able to reintroduce these sort of into the public consciousness and see what people think of them now. I'm a really big fan of Thrill Jockey too. They 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 put out so many cool records. Everything from the Sarah Louise stuff to the Golden Retriever stuff to, I mean, a billion other things. You know, they're 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 a really cool label. That's a cool partner. Yeah, and those those three albums in particular feel like so like Chicago is so much a part of their story. Like yeah. after that point, like we started splintering and moving to different places. But like those are definitely that's our Chicago trilogy. And we, I feel like it felt really important to partner with a Chicago label that has like a rich history in that scene. Yeah, yeah, that's so cool. That's so cool. Well, are is Pelican working on anything new that you can talk about or? No, right now we've just been focused on these shows. Laurent hadn't played guitar on a stage in 10 years. So like, we've just been like rehearsing, 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 trying to get like the old stuff down. And like, I feel like once we're, we have another run of dates coming this month in a couple of weeks. And like, once we're on the other side of that, we can start to try and take stock of where we are and like what's next. Oh, that's killer, man. Well, we keep them short here on Wasteoid, so I'll, I'll, I'll conclude here. But thank you for taking the time to hang out with us on Wasteoid Swift. Yeah, th thanks for the opportunity. It's good to catch up. Hey, thanks for hanging out with us here on Wasteoids. This week's episode features original music by Sam Means. 
and a few selections from the new Relayer album available from Gilead Media. If you have any prog rock opinions you want to share, anything you want to let us know that's going on, all you have to do is give us a call, 1-877-WASTOIDS, to get in touch. You can find us on YouTube and Twitter and Instagram, and of course, at wasteoids.com. So check it out. We've got all sorts of crazy live stuff. Just put up an incredible set with Dave Parlay, formerly of the Cholo Goth Band Prayers. Uh, you're going to want to check that one out. All right, wasteoids.com. We'll be back with you next week. Take it easy until then. Yeah.